Coming to you from Crash Studios in Music City, USA, Nashville. This is the Rich Redman Show. On this episode, drummer with the hit maker Spin Doctor, Aaron Comas. And now, Rich Redman. What's up, rock and rollers out in podcast land? Yep, that's that time. Another exciting episode of the Rich Redman Show coming to you from two cities today, the coasts. All the flyover states in the middle, you know, you guys know that Jason Aldean song, Flyover States. Well, today's guest coming from the heart of New York City. I'm coming from sunny West Hollywood, California. This is the show where we talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And, of course, I'm talking to comedians, authors, thought leaders, producers, songwriters, and, yes, drummers. I know so many drummers. We're thick as thieves. We get into it. I mean, if we go to a bar, we're closing that sucker down. We could be talking about widgets, pedal tension, you know, do you use die cast hoops or all the way into the deep intellectual stuff? And hopefully we're going to get into the deep intellectual stuff with today's guest. So guys out there, I just got to introduce you. I mean, this is like rock and roll royalty. Today's guest was a founding member of the award-winning Spin Doctors, 33 years with the group, New York City drummer, but that's not it. He's also a producer and a composer. He's worked with Joan Osborne, Mark Cohen, Isaac Hayes, Ivan Neville. He also leads his own group. How you doing, Aaron Comis? Hey, Rich. Good to see you, man. How yeah, are you? Yeah, man. We were, hey. we, we were talking off camera. Some of the greatest things happened before I press record um, about a lot of the things that we have in common, man. And there really is just so much stuff. But first, what's the deal with the New York City donuts? I'm, I troll your Instagram <laughs> page and you're always like rewarding yourself with a little self-love. You know, uh, one of my weaknesses is donuts. You know, I'm a real foodie first off, you know, but I try, I try to be pretty healthy with it. You know what I mean? I'm not eating donuts every day like it might look like, but you know, like maybe once a week or once every two weeks. Yeah. If I want something sweet, I'm going to get a donut. So I've tried all the, you know, I'm always on the mission to try the latest. And my thing with donuts is I'm not really, I'm not into the hipster donut. There's all these like, you know, donuts with gold on top or, Front you know, loops and yeah, it's like, I don't want that. I want like a good glazed donut or a cruller. But uh, yeah, so like there's a few places that are on the top of my list and check my Instagram page and you, you'll see them. <laughs> but so, yeah, I just, I love a good donut. I mean, you, well, that's, that's the funny thing is, is that I, I like basic stuff too. Like I like a nice, like a chocolate cake donut or just like an old fashioned, yeah. just straight up, yeah, glazed donut, fresh. And, you know, of course in Tennessee, we have the, we have the hot and fresh um, right out of the oven uh crispy creams i don't know if you're a crispy cream guy. Oh, I, I, I do i do like crispy cream i mean they're <laughs> for a glazed donut man it's hard to beat and you know donuts donuts also have like about a they really have about an hour shelf life you know they're they're incredible for the first hour and then they you don't want to get a donut like at three in the afternoon you know you got to go in the morning that's the great thing about crispy cream is they're coming out all day hot you know but but i gotta say a, a donut could you know this could be argued but it could be like pizza where even if it's bad it's good that is true <laughs> <laughs> that is definitely true cool man so like well i don't want to be the typical okay so how did it all start for you but really um you, uh, Dallas, Texas, we have that in common in the sense that we studied with the same teacher, Henry Oxdell. Shout out to Henry Oxdell. Great. And, and, we're, and I'm, after this, we're going to look him up. We're going to catch up with Henry. Yeah. Henry's, so, Henry is incredible. One of the best teachers out there. He's taught so many great drummers. I was really lucky to hook up with him in high school. You know, I had a, lot of, a bunch of teachers before Henry. I started out when I was nine, and I just did practice pad and snare drum for the first two years. I was really lucky to work with this guy named Jack Iden, who was just the local drum teacher at the local Brook Mays. And it was, just it was just lucky. You know, my first lesson, it was like he taught me how to hold the sticks, which is why traditional grip, which is why I play traditional. Yeah. And I, you know, I remember, I'll never forget, he wrote on a little, one of those little, like, notepads, he wrote out the, the rough, the five-stroke roll, the flam, and I think the single-stroke roll. And, like, you know, the first two years, it was all rudiments and reading. And I would kick and scream coming in there. I'd have my mom come in and, and ask him, like, when can Aaron get a drum set, you know? Because I wanted a drum kit, you know? And he was like, well, you know, you'll hate me now, but you'll love me later. And it's so true. 
So, yeah. you know, I, sp I spent the first couple of years just strictly on uh, rudiments and reading in my hands. Finally got a drum kit. And my first real drum teacher was Rick Latham. Great drummer. All right. Yeah, we're both teaching at uh, MI. Exactly. Online. Yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah. Oh, cool. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, he was in Dallas at the time. He, had ju he was just about to put out his book, Funk's Advanced Funk Studies. Oh, wow, what a book. Incredible book. And I got to work with him out of the book before it was actually released. You know, it was pretty cool. Nice. And then when Rick moved to L.A. a few years later, he said, you know, I want you to call up Henry Oxdell. And so that's how I got hooked up with Henry. And Henry really just, you know, it was all the, um, as you know, I mean, working on big band chart reading and interpretation, all kinds of crazy technical books. But the thing that was so cool, looking back on it, um, doing the big band chart interpretation thing and also having an opportunity to do that at school because the school I was in, was, I, I was able to play in a big band there in combo. This is, this is uh, the Dallas Art Magnet School? Exactly. Yeah. The yeah. Dallas Art Magnet. I so you were applying more... what you were learning from Henry. Exactly. I had a real opportunity to, to use it in, in real time. But what was really, what I realized is like, that was really setting me up for most of what I do, which is interpreting songs. I mean, that's what drummers do, right? right. We, interpret, we interpret songs and we play for the song, hopefully. Yeah. And, that, and that was a real good lesson. Um, just that whole thing about, you know, setting up the hits in big band, doing the fill, you know, the short note, long note concept. I mean, all that stuff applies to what we do really in any context, but particularly in like any kind of pop rock center songwriter context. I mean, it's such a similar sort of uh, concept. So it was... It was just really fortunate, you know, as you know, to be able to have a teacher like that in those formative years. I mean, I'm so grateful to that. Yeah. I mean, that, that, what a great one to have early on. I mean, Henry was kind of like my finishing school in the sense that I was in my early 20s when I got to him, right? And it was like a lot of yeah. singing and conceptual stuff. And, and that stuff really helps because, like, I, I try to tell my students, look, you should be able to count the rhythm. So, like, you know, page... 37 from syncopation you're like one and, and three four one two t and, and but you should also be able to sing it like do that yeah. do that da, da, and he was really into that and so that stuff totally. really really pays off and i hear that in your playing you know it's i think it's just such a cool thing this drum fraternity thing that we have because i really feel like i know you because in recent years you know you have, you have, we had MySpace and then Facebook and then Instagram. We could, and you could put things up. You're like, oh, I feel like I know this guy. Like I could follow his life. He likes donuts. He, he's a, <laughs> he, you know, he's in the heart of Manhattan. He's got this cool drum room. Uh, if you guys aren't, uh, if you guys are just listening to this, Aaron is set up in front of his cool drum room with like about yeah. six or seven Yamaha Ludwig drum, yeah, drum sets, tons of snare drum, really expensive microphones. Um, it looks like a, like a playground, right? Um, but, but just to be able to, to connect like this and chat because I used to run around my college campus with my anti-skip Walkman cassette player and then the CD player listening to Pocket Full of Kryptonite and thinking to myself, who is this cat? Because he does a great job with this band, but I can just tell he's not your standard pop rock guy. There's some isms in there. These little Mona Lisas that he drops here and there. It's almost like a fusion cat who's playing in a, in a, in a soul funk pop rock band. Oh, well, I appreciate that. You know? I mean, look, you know, I've all, I've, I'm somebody that's always really loved listening and playing to a whole lot of different types of music, you know? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I have, I come up equally listening to rock music, guys like Bonham, you know, as I do guys like Gad and Purdy, as I do guys like Tony Williams and Elvin Jones. And I've always loved playing all that music, you know? So, like, when I moved to New York City, I did. I when I graduated high school, I graduated high school in 1986 from that arts magnet place. Beautiful. And then I did one year at Berkeley, mm -hmm. which was great. It was like the year that I'd shed for 10 hours a day. Yeah. And played for four hours at night, just drums, music. Then I moved back. I moved back to Dallas for a year and got a house with some friends and did every gig under the sun: jazz gig, rock gigs, blues gigs. Studied with Henry again. Yeah. Got into got into some really deep stuff with Henry, and then I moved to New York City and went to the New School. And I came to New York because, you know, Henry always told me, all through high school, he put it in my head. He's like, you know, you could be a big fish in a small pond, stay in Dallas, nothing wrong with that. But I get the feeling you want more than that. And if, you, if that's the case, you know, you need to think about moving to either New York or L.A. Yeah. 
at the time Nashville wasn't as sort of as much of a hub or it was it was just all country you know yeah um and and I picked New York you know I a lot of my favorite music uh was made here being really into jazz I wanted to be around those guys but when I came here I was kind of equally into being a guy a jazz guy a studio guy or a rock band guy yeah and uh I wanted to prepare myself I always tried to prepare myself to whatever sort of situation presented itself and ultimately, pretty quickly after moving to the New York and going to the new school, I met the guys, Chris and Eric, at the new school, and we formed the Spin Doctors. And, um, and it was one of these things where I was already doing other gigs and stuff, but about three or four months in, I was like, you know, this thing is pretty cool. This is like a good opportunity for me to develop my own style. Um, people seem to like it. I like these guys. It's an opportunity for me to also contribute to the songwriting, which I've always been into. Yeah. And I said, I'm going to give this a couple of years. You know, I'm going to put all my eggs in this basket for a couple of years. And if it's not happening in a couple of years, you know, I'll, I'm in New York. There's going to be other opportunities. And it was like, I think, I think, I think it's important. You know, I always tell people like, you know, have a plan, but also be ready to deviate from that plan. You know what I mean? Right. And, and be prepared. And um, the good news is the Spin Doctors thing worked out great. We're still together all these years later. Awesome. All these, years. but th you know, thirty years down the line, I've had the opportunity to do all those other things that I wanted to do as well, doing you know jazz stuff and studio stuff. But um, I, pr I appreciate you saying that, you know, and it's true. I mean, that band gave me a real opportunity, especially at that time when I was like nineteen, twenty, twenty one you know, to, to play with these guys. And we were playing five nights a week in, in Manhattan. It wasn't like most bands were rehearsing five nights a week and then trying to get a record deal and doing a showcase once a month. And we kind of flipped that. We were like, you know, we want to write songs and play gigs and make a living. And we weren't as concerned with the record deal. And that kind of, that came to us because we built up this big fan base in New York City and it just, it became this undeniable scene. Um, but it, it gave me an opportunity. I'm do, playing with the same people five nights a week, an original band. Yeah. And it, so here, you know, here I was an with an opportunity to do my own thing, you know. That's incredible. Yeah, because I remember, I mean, I remember how I sounded when I was 19 years old and I was playing in the Texas Tech big band and we're reading like Maynard Ferguson charts. And, but at this, and then, you know, for the next seven years, it was like you also got to work on your – xylophone your your vibraphone <laughs> your four mallet marimba your classical yeah. timpani like and so i just you know i jumped through those hoops because i knew but i wanted to play a drum set but that's what i i think is so great about choosing a city like new york people that choose new york city it's such a ever-changing evolving it's almost like an organism and it's and it's i mean you've been there what now 30 something years 33 years yeah yeah what changes have you noticed for the good and the worst? The well, I mean, you know, again, and one of the other reasons I moved to New York besides just the career opportunities is that I wanted to get my ass kicked. I wanted to be around the best musicians in the world, you know, and many yeah. of them are here. And, you know, no better way to, to get better at what you do is to have these incredible people around you. So, like, that was amazing to immediately dive into this. I mean, I studied with Bernard Purdy my first year here. So it was like, come on, you know. Oh, did he, did he, did he, was it like the video? Like, oh, yeah, Aaron, yeah, yeah man, that's it, good. <laughs> you know that video where he's kind of like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah that's sick. He, he's actually a lot more reserved, like, one-on-one -on -one in a lesson, you know. Wow, okay. But, I mean, I was also having the opportunity to work with him, study with him, when that when the band was forming you know but like things have and, and it's also the reason why i'm still here is because i continually get my ass kicked by a lot of those guys that are older than me that i that were my heroes and inspirations then and then now my own peers you know and now of course there's all these young cats and so it's like a con it really just whips you into shape and it's like there's no room to rest on your laurels in New York City and like I've always been I mean I still practice every single day beautiful um, and you know it's but part of the reason I think I have the inspiration to do that and continue to grow besides just my own desire is that like you know there's just so much incredible talent you know? yeah and these, these days it's it you find it on the internet as well so it's like a whole nother thing but the city has changed to get back to your original question you know when I moved to New York it was like crackhead central yeah you know it was a dangerous place to be i mean you know it was not safe and um you know we'd be doing gigs till four in the morning 
and you're walking over. It, and it was, it was literally the, the height of the crack epidemic. I mean, it was yeah. weird. It was like, you know, Night of the Living Dead. I mean, it was zombies. <laughs> it was weird, man. You know? Barbara. It, it was messed up, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I lived through that. And then obviously I saw the whole transition when things changed a lot throughout the 90s. And um, the city became a safer place. Which I think is good. A lot of people complain about that, but I'm I'm all for that personally. Oh yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, you know, um, you know, and like you know, people. I find particularly people our age who were around back then like to complain about oh, it's not the same as it was. The glory days, you know, the session days, the clubs. The truth is, I don't, you know. I still think I still think it's an incredible scene. There's still lots of sessions. Sure. The bigger the bigger studios have closed, so that's a drag. You know, clubs have always been a rip off. I mean, you know, nobody ever made money in the clubs unless you packed the place and charged a cover. Yeah. You know, so it's like I I have I try to keep an optimistic attitude. I don't want I never fall down that trap of being like the glory days. You know, the good old days when things were good. It's like they were they were never great. It's always been tough for a musician. You've always had to work really hard. You've had to be willing to struggle at some point, and you have to be willing to adapt when things change. You know, and you know I see the younger generation coming in now, and it's different, and it is harder, I think. But they're not complaining. They're just doing it. You know, you do it. You know, doing it with a smile on your face. Well, and and you've got a great home base because how exciting to be in a band for over thirty years you know, with some of your best friends. And it's, it's that classic tale of like guys in college, like REM, these, these guys are in college together and they start this band and they change the world, you know, one song at a time. Um, how did that first record come, uh, come about? Now you say you're, you're, you're developing or, or, or participating in the songwriting process. So I didn't, I didn't research that. So you, you guys would split publishing or you would all come together on, even if someone say wrote the lyrics, you're like, Hey, this arrangement and this musical idea is val is worthy of publishing. Yeah. We always tried to come up with a, with a really fair arrangement. That's great. We've, all, we've always split our publishing equally. Nice. And then we, we kind of came up with a system in the song writing where, you know, if one or two guys wrote the bulk of a song, they would get a little bit more, but everybody got something. Yeah. And I think, I, I think that's the reason we're still together, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? Because it, it, um, a lot of bands break up because, you know, one guy gets all the bread and, and you start to feel like a hired gun and that can be a problem if you're in a band. Right. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, I contributed a lot. I play guitar, so I I, nice. I I bring in you know like musical ideas. I'm not I'm not much of a lyricist, but I bring in musical ideas. And uh, luckily, the guys have been were open to that, and it was cool. And um, you know, it's particularly I mean, and that was one of the things that really sort of hooked me into the band too. Like when we were first starting out, and at first I was just oh, this is another gig. I play some gigs with these guys, see where it goes. And once we sort of got into that collaborative process, that's when I was really like, wow, this is cool. This is something I, you know, and it was working well. This is, it, it really hooked me in to the, to the, um, to be part of all the creative aspects of the band, you know? Yeah. Well, you know, I name checked yesterday because I just interviewed Mickey Curry and we were talking about snare drums and like, I was like, you know, do you crack shots? And he's like, yeah, 99% of the time I'm cracking shots. And we started talking about Yamaha snare drums and his, I was like, you know, what kind of a sound, if you can't get a black beauty or the producers, he's like, yeah, I use the uh, seven inch birch, you know, recording custom. That was my secret weapon forever. And then we were talking about your snare drum sound on, you know, two princes. And I said, I don't even, you know, I, I don't think it's a piccolo, but I feel like you sold a lot of piccolos. Well, it's that drum right there. It's Here, a, I'll get it. I'll it's show, a, I'll it's show a you. Brady, right? Oops. So Aaron is walking over to his wall of snare drums. There's about a good 15 snare drums on the wall. It's a brown Brady. It's a piccolo. Oh, it is a piccolo, yeah. Sorry, let me put my headphones back on here. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a Jara Piccolo Brady snare. Nice. And that that's the drum I used on Two Princes. Did you did you sell a lot of them for 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 them? They probably they, would love I, you. They did. I mean, I did. I mean, I still I'm still in touch with Kelly Brady. Yeah. Um, in Nashville. She, yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. And yeah, I, I think they they she definitely they definitely sold quite a few drums because of me. And I was you know it was great. Um, but it's funny, man, because and I used that drum on just on two princes, 
And on the bulk of the record, I, I used the, the other one, another one that's over there, which is a 14 by five and a half, sort of standard size Jara. Nice. And then on two of the songs, I used a little 12 inch by six. So it was all Brady's. And funny story, man, um, because Two Princes was, was, we recorded this record, Pocket Full of Kryptonite, in two different segments. Right. You know, originally, we signed a deal with Epic Records, and they wanted to put out an EP first. So we went into the power station. Nice. And, uh, you know, incredible. You know, and I'm like 20 years old or something. And it's like, you know, Jesus. It's, it's hard to find a better room that where drums sound. Just just take off your headphones when you hit the drum in that room. It's just, and, and that was the it. first... That was the first um, studio that Mickey Curry worked in when he was 23 years old. He was taking the train in from Connecticut. So there's like a med And I believe the power station, the band, right. did their record there. And I love me some Tony Thompson, God oh, rest oh, his yeah. soul. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, yeah. so you're, you're, you're walking into this place with all this history already. Right. And that's, that's amazing. And, uh, and then the room just sounds so good. So we're doing this EP and... The idea was to record like six songs. One of those songs was Two Princes. And I'll never forget, we're, this is back in the days where people would, would, would want to spend like, you know, five hours on a snare sound. You know, this is just like 1990, 91 when we right. recorded this. And so we were, we were kind of coming out of that 80s thing into the 90s. But a lot of producers were still sort of, you know how people always tend to try to re recreate what was already a hit. Right. I've always believed you need to recreate your own thing because that's what's going to make a hit. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So they wanted me to use a big old fat Ludwig deep snare tuned real low. Yeah, on two princes. And and we and I was like, you know, I really want to use this this sound. This is kind of part of the signature sound of the band, you know. Yeah. And uh, this went on for a couple hours. And luckily, you know, all the guys in the band had my back. They were like, you know, we really want Aaron to use this. He wants to do it. They totally supported me. And ultimately, you know, we won the battle. And, um, you know, I mean, imagine if I would have used like a deep Ludwig on that song. Totally different vibe. And then I was looking at your body of work over the years, and you guys are very prolific, a lot of albums. You, you started, as things progressed, you had started getting into some medium tuning and some Fleetwood Mac rumors tuning. And totally. it just changes the whole character. But I, I, I love that. It worked so great for the time, man. And it's, it, it, it's, it's part of the sound of that, particularly that period of the band. Um, you know, it's like... I've always been attracted to bands and, and musicians that have a signature sound, you know, and I, I loved Bonham. You knew Bonham in two seconds. I loved Stuart Copeland. Yeah. You know, and so, like, I wanted to have some kind of a signature thing. I didn't want to every, and, and as, as we grow and we go on and you start doing sessions, you know, I opened up my, now it's like, you know, I have all these tools and I'm, Nine times out of ten, I go with a deeper sound now, you know. I don't always, I, I, if you listen to Pocket Full of Kryptonite, pretty much 100% of the backbeats are the rim shot, you know, stick in the middle edge on the rim shot thing. But with, with a lot of what else I do, it's not that now, you know. Um, and you, you know, you learn to adapt. But with the band, that's like, that's just part of, this, part of the thing, you know. So when you guys play live, you probably got to have at least two drums on stage, right? Like, which one are you going to pick for your main? Is it going to be the more of a whack? Uh, yeah, that's my main. And then the and, side uh, is going to be. <laughs> I don't use a side, but I, you know what I, I have, I'll use like a, like one of those uh, big fat snares. Exactly. So it's like you know, it's instantaneous deep yeah. sound. You know, it's those things are great for that. They really are, and they make some good tom mufflers now. That I was like, my friend uh, Blair Sinta has a nice tracking room over here in Glendale, and I and I was hit these DW toms, and, he, and I was like, oh, what are these? He goes, those are just big fat snares, but they've got them for yeah. the toms now, where they're not, they don't take up the whole. It's just a part of it. They're great. I love them. I'm yeah. really into like, I love the, those kind of mufflers and putting shirts on my drums. And, you know, when you work, as you know, working in the studio, it's like, it's, you know, the drums are such a character in any track. Yeah. It really, really makes the difference between an open tight snare or a loose snare. Or, or, and, I, you know, I've learned that, you know, we have to be respectful and you don't want to take up too much space. And, yeah. you know, so I'm a big fan of like dead dry drums now, you know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I love that. I love that, like the Mick Fleetwood thing. I the just handkerchiefs love that. and the tea towels. And like, oh, I, I always have those stuff re ready to go. Like, the majority absolutely. of things I get called for in Nashville, though, are like, you know, it's like, uh, it's just big open drums, cracking yeah. snare. Because we record in a room with like a 30 foot ceilings, and it's just right. like, here we yeah. go. Yeah. You know? That's great. Yeah. So when you, when you moved to New York, who did you move to town with? Who were your contemporaries your age? 
Well, I moved up here with a friend of mine from Dallas who was an, a visual artist. He, he, he was going to School of Visual Arts. So we moved yeah. up here together and shared an apartment together. And we were both going to school, and, you know. And then, you know, we kind of both found our ways and our different worlds. And, uh, and you know, very quickly, I, you know, like I said, I met up with the guys in the band. And this whole, this whole circle of amazing musicians that were going to the new school at the time. You know, um, you know, John Popper from Blues Traveler was there. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. Yes. So, like, we were doing all these gigs with Blues Traveler. So that was this whole scene, oh. you know, musically and social. It was a big sort of social hangout scene. And um, Joan Osborne was part of that scene, you know, mm -hmm. who I later became very associated with to this day. And, uh, you know, and then I was doing, like, jazz gigs, too. I mean, I, I, play, I used to play a lot with Arnie Lawrence, who was the head of the school, used to use me in his, in his band. So it's like I was playing with teachers at the school, and you know it's just a great creative scene. Um, you know the the uh, you know, the late '80s, early '90s. You know that whole time was just an amazing moment. You know, um, in New York City. You know, totally. And, and again, it's still an amazing moment. But that was just you know for, from my world, it was it was great. And you know, I was just playing like almost every night of the week. You know. That's great. And then you had, did you have some tricks for getting your little small kid around? Uh, because I always hear that back in the day. It's like, okay, your hydro drums around the corner. You flag the guy down, but then, you know, he could take off with half your stuff. And, oh. That's exactly what we used to do. We used to, like, we had a system because it was all, nobody had backline back then. You know, everybody has backline now. And we had a system where we would basically bring all the stuff outside in front of the apartment, you know, drum set, amplifier and usually me and eric the guitar player would stand there with the stuff and chris the center would run around the corner and get a cab because if the cab saw you with all your shit they'd go right past you so chris would get in the car hey you know and then just pull over here and then we'd open the trunk and just start throwing the shit in before they got before they could sink it out you know uh, and because they didn't want to fuck with you you know if you if you had all that gear yeah but yeah i mean it was a real pain in the ass man we're talking about schlepping your your stuff around you know it was just yellow cabs. <laughs> but but yeah. the, those formative years, it's almost like when you're in your 20s, you like embrace this. It's like if, if you're smart, you realize it's part of the journey and it's to be actually you're bringing your dreams to fruition. And it's like probably one of the most exciting times of your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I, especially when you look back on it, all that, you know, that hard, hard work, you got to go through that, man. I mean, and, it, you know, the work never ends, as you know, but it's like it's a different period. And I look back on it, you know, in, a, in just a very positive way. I still listen. I still love the opportunity to set up my own kit. I mean, doesn't I don't have to do it that often? But something about when you set up your own drums, it's like this. You know, it's like oh, okay. You know, you feel like you worked a little for something. I don't know. It's a nice. It's a good feeling. You know, it really is. I I waited the first eight years in Nashville before I got Cartage, and then when I started like requesting Cartage, and the clients were paying for it, I was like. Why did I wait eight years? Why did, Why am I driving <laughs> yeah. around a minivan with drums right? to the, you know? Um, well, well, that's yeah. great. I feel like you're really smart because you have the home base of the band. It's so comfortable. It's an old pair of shoes. You have a, a democratic creative voice. Then you go and you'll work with other people as a side man. And then you're doing your uh, recording in your own place, sending files to people. And then you're a band leader. Now you have your own various groups that you've have various releases. Tell us about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I always sort of wanted to do something of my own, um, more in the sort of instrumental I don't necessarily call what I do jazz, but it's certainly jazz leaning. And around 2006, I finally got around to making my own record. And I, you know, the first step was to write a bunch of material. And I write mostly on guitar, acoustic guitar. And I came up with a good set of material that I felt good about. And then I, uh, I thought about who I wanted to use. And I had done a record in the 90s with Mark Cohn. And the guitar player was a guitar player named Bill Dillon. Bill played on all those like Robbie Robertson records and uh, a lot of the Peter Gable records. He's a real big session guy, particularly in the in that 80s period. And he's really, I just remember when I worked with him, I was so blown away by his style. It was this really ambient, totally unique thing. And I really liked that kind of guitar playing. Um, and I thought it would suit my music. So I called Bill and I said, hey, Bill, I'm, I'm going to do a record. I, would you like to do it? And he was like, yeah, I'd love to. And he's like, who are you thinking about using on bass? I was like, well... A dream of mine would be to call Tony Levin. <laughs> he's like, let's he's call like, him. 
So Tony, he's like, give me a minute, I'll, I'll call him. So in like 10 minutes, you know, Bill calls you back. He's like, okay, Tony lives up in Woodstock. Tony wants to do it. You know, I, I, got, I know a studio and an engineer up there we can go to. Turns out the guy, the engineer was Roman Clune, who is now my partner here in my studio. He's in the, he's in the control room over there. Wow. And that was, so that was the beginning of that relationship. So I made that record. It's called Catskills Cry. It was the first thing. Really cool record. But I didn't do any gigs with that band. You know, everybody lived in different places, and it was just a studio project. So then three or four years later, I decided I wanted to make another one and form a band in New York where I could play around town. So I called two of my favorite local musicians, Richard Hammond, bass player who I've worked with a lot. We play together with Joan Osborne, and we've done just a whole ton of, uh, you know, sessions together. He's like, you know, one of my, you know how it is with bass players. You get these, these develop these relationships. And sure. he's like right at the top of that for me. Um, he, and he's, you know, very versatile. He can kind of do anything. And then the guitar player, who's another guy that I just loved and had played with a lot over the years, was Teddy Kumpel. So I basically, uh, I had hired them to do this record. We ended up making uh, two studio records together and started playing around a lot. And, um, you know, it just developed into a really great thing where we, you know, I, we, we did a little bit of touring, but it's mostly just like a couple times a month in clubs in New York City. And it's over the years, it's just developed into this great thing. I've since added a, a saxophone player, and sometimes I'll have a keyboard player. I, I use this guy, Leon Grunbaum, who plays this crazy instrument called a Sam Chilean. Oh, wow. Like the, yeah, it's, it's, look it up, Sam Chilean. It's, he, he basically invented it. <laughs> it's a long story, but he's incredible. So it's just turned into this. And for me, it's like sort of the ultimate like creative outlet for me. Um, it's an opportunity for me to just mix all the sort of influences that I have. And, uh, you know, it's compositional, but it's also we do a lot of improvisation inside of it. So it's just a real open s situation. And I love it, you know, and I miss it because I haven't played with these guys for about a year now. So oh, it's, it's amazing but, stuff. And just the fact that you you're your own artist on Spotify, you look up you and you are yeah. there with your own music. Um, would you would you get into the uh, TV and film game? You think is that as a potential step for you? I, I've done a little bit. I mean, I haven't pursued it heavily. I've gotten a few like you know placements with that with those with that material in some of that stuff. Yeah, I never I never really pushed it hard. I mean, um, you know, there was a time when it was, I guess, about ten years ago when it was sort of like the little secret, like oh, independent music. They're gonna, it's real easy to get placed. But now the whole thing's blowing up so much. It's a little bit. It's a little yeah. bit different. It's very. It's far more competitive. So I've used it more. It's really more for me just a, a hundred percent a creative outlet. Um, I don't really think of that as like a money maker for me. You know, it's the kind of thing where I, I take care of my band. I want to be treated. I want to treat them like I would want to be treated working with anybody else. Yeah. But you know, it's like you you know you look at the whole aspect of your career and it's like. You know, like you said before, Spin Doctor is kind of like my day job, you know, and but I love it. It's a it's a really good I'm, I'm still there because it I feel like it's fun for me and it's creative. And if and we're and we, we still like I think the band sounds better than we ever have, you know, and if, it, if that wasn't the case, I wouldn't want to do it. I wouldn't want to just show up and and sound like shit. Like you see a lot of bands that maybe they don't they only have one original member and it's like it's just not like that legit i feel like that's, we're, that's rough man when there's only one, one original member yeah. it's tough and i i understand i can see how that happens it's tough to be in a band with the same guys but like i feel like it's legit we're a legitimate band we go out there and we kill it and it's great but i also acknowledge like you know it's it's my bread and butter you know and then you know i got the studio stuff and the sideman stuff those are all money makers and then my own project that's not a money maker, but it's like it's just a, a beautiful creative outlet for me. You know, you have I think you have to look at the whole spectrum of your career and look at like some things are going to sort of pay the bills and make money and other things might be more of a break even. There might even be some things where you lose a little bit of money. But, as, you know, as long as the whole thing's balancing out, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I agree. Sometimes you have to um, pay to play if, a, if a, an interesting opportunity comes up. And I have done that. But then the the benefit far outweighs your investment on your part in the big picture. Yeah, and I also believe, like, I try to only do stuff that I really like to do. I mean, yeah. I've, I've learned how to say no to gigs. I mean, I know it's like drummers were like, no, you know, they, you can't even say the word no. 
But it's been really healthy for me to learn how to say no because there's been a few times throughout the years where I did something just for the money and it just wasn't a good experience. So I felt like if I did this too much, I was going to lose my motivation. And so I'm real careful about like associating my st- myself with you know, artists and musicians that are going to inspire me. And, and sometimes even if it means like not making as much money, that's fine. Like I'd rather, I'd rather take less and do something I really love than more with something that's going to just sort of like, because I think that ultimately you, you will do better. I always tell young people, especially like in a place like New York, I'm sure it applies to anywhere, but let's say you're out there playing the local clubs and you're playing every gig under the sun, but you're playing with a lot of stuff that's not very good. Well, then you're not going to sound that good either. And people are going to hear that. They're not going to be interested. But if you're playing with people and artists that are really good, that make you sound really good, even if you're not making a lot of money with that particular thing, people are going to hear you and they're going to want to use you. Yeah. And I've had that happen to me a lot based on some of those decisions, working with somebody that I thought, I, I love this artist. I just, I'm not even, I don't even care about the money. I want to play. And then, you know, Oh, can you play my record? I heard you play with this person. You know, so I think it's really important to be. Um, I realize everybody's got to pay the bills, and you got to do what you got to do. That's totally cool, but I think, uh, you know, it's important to look at the whole picture about where you want to go, and make those decisions early on. Yeah. You know, you have like when I was talking about how I made that decision to give the spin doctors a couple of years, and I struggled. I mean, we were broke, you know. But it's like, I think it, everybody's got to go through that. And I think if you look, you're, what, what you're looking at down the road, 20, 30 years, is going to really be dependent on that. A lot of those decisions you make, I think, when you're in your 20s. The Rich Redman Show will be right back. Those who are self-employed, especially musicians, think homeownership is unattainable. For Bruce Klein, it took seven years to purchase his first home as a self-employed working musician. But once he did, man, was it satisfying. So he decided he wanted to help other musicians and creatives gain that same satisfaction. Bruce earned his lending license and is now helping people avoid the mistakes he made on his seven-year journey. If you're a self-employed musician, he can help. Go to musiciansmortgage.com, powered by Movement Mortgage. Bruce Klein, NMLS, number 1465948, Movement Mortgage supports equal housing opportunity. NMLS, number 39179, NMLS, consumeraccess.org. Henry Ford once said that if you need a machine and don't buy it, then you will ultimately find that you have paid for it and don't have it. Nothing could be truer about energy-efficient LED lighting in your business. At Big Dot Lighting, we can show you how a portion of your savings from a commercial LED lighting upgrade will be paid for in hardly any time at all. Until then, you're paying for them anyway. Book a no-cost lighting energy assessment with Big Dot Lighting. At least 30% of your utility bill is waiting to be saved. Go to BigDotLighting.com. Are you a drummer looking to expand your drumming vocabulary or take your career to the next level? You can connect with me for one-on-one virtual lessons and consultations that are now 30% off. I cover topics like styles, reading music, the Nashville number system, charting, music business 101, and career guidance. Simply send me an email at booking at richredmond.com to schedule. And for more information on all of my products and services, visit richredmond.com. This is the Rich Redman Show. It's really interesting and really true. I feel like saying no is a luxury and saying no is potentially a thing that happens for us drummers, you know, later in life. I mean, guys, you know, like yourself who can do a lot of different things. I took I took jobs I probably shouldn't have taken in the early days of Nashville, but I said to myself, what if I approach this with in- incredible, like extreme methodical professionalism? In other words, drums look great. I'm so early. First one there, last one. I've, I know the material better than anyone else. I got the te- tempos nailed. So even if the suits come with their cigars and they say, like, I don't like the kid. I don't like the front guy, but they go, that guy's holding the whole thing together and yeah, somehow ab- you know it that gets around a- absolutely uh, you're right and i think you know also depending on sort of what city you're in yeah. those things can apply in different ways you know um and i you know i've never lived in nashville I mean, how long have you been in nashville i know you're you got twin um i lived in Nash- uh see i moved there in march of 1997 so i was like 24 okay. years yeah yeah so you're you're you made that smart decision that you just said based on that city and that scene and how that works you know you got to start like on the demos and then eventually a guy like yourself you end up with the big records and the big gig like you got so yeah. 
So you have to, you have to, you have to do that. Uh, I mean, at whatever on one level, you always have to start at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but there are situations, and again, more now, I think we're. You know, I know that if I do a certain thing too much, it's gonna it's gonna burn me out, and that's not good. I want to keep my motive, you know, my energy, my motivation to. I don't want to, you know, it's because you know it's it, you can overwork and you can do things that are going to burn you out. And burnout is something that does happen to a lot of musicians around our age. Yeah. And I think you have to be careful not to let that happen. I mean, truthfully, I'm as motivated as I've ever been to keep getting better and keep changing. Yeah. And that's a hard thing. You know, and I haven't always felt like that. There's certainly been periods where you, oh man, I've been just working, working. I'm, I'm burnt. I need a break. So, you know, you have to be. I think just, you know, just, just uh, cautious shake, of those things. Shake it up, and yeah, do yeah. different things. So, I mean, I, yeah. I feel like if you've been playing with the same guys for over 30 years, there's a lot of things to celebrate, a lot of victories. Um, but I can imagine you sounding better than ever because everybody has that additional 30 years of experience and thousands of hours in the trenches to bring back to the situation. So it's almost like evolving. Yeah. And, and also in our case, like all four of us are, we're all what I call lifers. I mean, I think we all would have, had we not met each other, we'd all be doing music. So everybody keeps up on their instruments and is motivated and practices and, and uh, we all do other things, which we motivates us to come back together you know, if that's all I did for 30 years with spin doctors, I, I'd be burnt. <laughs> but, you know, all these other aspects, you come back to this home base and it's, you know, and when everybody sounds really good and it's fun, it, it feels great. And listen, I mean, there's been years inside of the, those 33 years that were a real bummer where we didn't get a law or we had problems. I mean, it's just typical with bands that you go through that. But I think, you know, now more than ever, we are a little bit older. You don't let those stupid little things bother you anymore. You know, something that would be the end of the world when you're 25. It's like, now it's like, well, who cares? Yeah, we only got <laughs> like one third of the items on the rider. Where's my green M&Ms? <laughs> exactly. That's crazy. So I love the fact that you're, you know, you practice every day. Um, what are, you know, you achieve your level of success. What do you work on? What are you working on on the kit? Well, mostly when I practice, um, I like to do like just work on like rudiments and hand stuff at home on my practice pad. Yes. Most of what I work on is in like is like in four way independence. I've been doing a lot of that lately. Um, you know the syncopation book which you mentioned, page thirty seven. That's the best. I I use that every day. You know, and there's Henry's the guy that turned me on to that back then, and you know opened my eyes to all the endless possibilities of how you can use that. So I I'm always coming up with crazy uh, four way independence ideas. So I, a lot of what I work on is technical stuff. I try to divide it up between sort of independence, you know, warm-ups, and then my own concepts, you know. Yeah. But I try not to come in here and just play stuff that I'm good at. I always try to work on stuff that I, that I need work on, trying to push something forward. And a lot of the stuff I work on, I may never use. But, I've, but I feel like, you know, technique and independence and that stuff is just a way to – when you're playing something, even the most simple thing, to have that comfort zone when you do that. So, you know, it's it's almost like, you know, when you when you rehearse, I'm sure like with you, you, you do these massive tours. And when you're doing a tour that big, all that production and all that, I'm guessing you guys probably do a lot of rehearsal before you go do the the tour. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, you know, it's not as much as like, say, a pink, you know, where there's dancers and stuff. Yeah. You know, but, but we get in there, you know, there's a lot to coordinate. And, and and by doing that, once you get on the big stage, you know, it's it's easier. The nerves, even if you have some nerves, they go away quicker or it's sort of like thin kicks in where you're like, I'm prepared, you know. Yeah. So I think, you know, I think preparation is key. And even in situations where you may not rehearse, like my own my own group, I mean, we barely rehearse. It's, it's most because it's there's a lot of improv. But like the kind of stuff I practice, it's just my comfort zone is there, you know. And even with the Spin Doctors, like we're a band that rarely rehearses. We've we've almost, I mean, in 33 years, we've, I mean, we barely rehearse, man, you know, because it's just when we first started, our rehearsal was the gig. We would play five nights a week and we might get together once a month and work on some new, new material and then we'd hash it out on stage. 
So like by the time we got to making Pocket Full of Kryptonite, most of those songs had been played 300 times, you know? Oh, it's like the knack. Um, uh, you know, our engineer that records a lot of our records, he recorded that first knack record, and he's like, Rich, they were the tightest band in L.A. They literally went into the studio, played their live set without a click track, and that's the record. Yeah. It's a great way to, you know, develop a band sound, you know. So yeah. every, every every group is different, you know. Like I, I do this gig in Germany. I work with this. He's a major artist there. His name is Marius Westernhagen. He's kind of like, you know, the and, you know every country has like these big artists. You never hear of him here, but he sells out arenas over there. And I've done about five or six tours with him. And it's, it's really fun. It's mostly New York City musicians. It's great. But he rehearses for like three weeks to a month before the gig, you know. Wow. And, and I hadn't been in a lot of situations like that. You know, most of the people I work with, you know, they might do a few days of rehearsal or whatever and get ready for the tour, get ready for the gig. But it was the first time I'd been in a situation where we, where we did a month of rehearsal because it's got the big production, you know, we're doing the same set every night. It's arenas, sold out arenas. And I found that it was just, by the time we got to that first gig, we were so ready that it just took all the pressure off. And, 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 and you know, he's a guy that... He's not like us where we're playing every day. He he does one tour every two years for like six weeks and then he maybe makes a record or goes to South Africa in his big house. You know, so it's like, you know, he needs that time and he wants his band to be really and it, it but it I really understand how how beneficial that can be, particularly for these these big tours. Cause you know, you don't want to get up. You can't get up there and fold, you know. No, and you can't. Especially. You can't. You can't be rushing away with the tempo, or you might be playing to a click, and it's just got to be totally on. So, you know, having that opportunity to go over it and go over, even though it can be boring, it really pays off when you get to the show. And so, it's the same way with practice. It's just like, or the same way before I do a recording session. If I have the, you know, you know, a lot of times you might learn the song in the studio, and that's right. cool too. But anytime I have the opportunity to prepare before. I'm in. Yeah. And, you know, and in, and in New York, I'm sure it's the same in Nashville. Even if you're playing a club gig and you have one rehearsal, which is kind of standard for some like a singer songwriter gig, you know, you show up to the rehearsal like that's the gig. Right. And, you know, when I grew up in Dallas, you remember Dallas, it's different. A rehearsal, okay, people show up an hour late, they got a six pack of beer. They think you're supposed to learn the songs in rehearsal. You know, that, doesn't, that doesn't fly in New York City. You know, no. it's like, you know, so it's, it's, uh, I just, I can't stress enough how like, you know, practice and preparation, uh, are just so important, you know? Yeah. And there's certain, I mean, you're, you're, you got such great hands. I mean, that's like Henry said, you'll thank me later. You got such great hands, such a, a controlled stroke, such amazing difference between the ghost notes and the full strokes, which is like where a lot of guys, their shortcomings are you know they don't have that level of control and then you can go and do your spangalang and do your latin and then you could have a massive backbeat and so for me i just know that some of those like the smaller twitch muscles like my fast bebop and then my samba bass drum some of the first things to get rusty if i'm playing boom whack you know totally and like you know for instance one of the things i've been working on this this year like in you know the pandemic it's been a, a lot of focused practice because we've had more time yeah and you know i went back to some of the books i was doing with henry or stuff i did when i was 19 like up tempo swing back then I, I could just fly it was like you know boom boom but you're after 30 years of being on the gig and in the studio those things can fall by the wayside real quick um so i've been really trying to kind of get that get that rust off and get back to that but it's hard i mean the only way to keep that stuff up is to practice it i mean that's yeah not, i mean that, don't call giant steps right now please <laughs> yeah, you know I, I, I mean exactly you know so um and uh but it's interesting you know and you know it's it's a different thing you know when, when we're on the gig you know how it is when you're in the studio when the red light goes on all that technique we work on whatever that goes out the window at that moment you're going to do whatever you can do to make that song sound good. Yeah. You know, if it means holding your, whatever, whatever it is, I mean, that's the way I see it. But you can also develop bad habits after years of doing that. So again, it's sort of like that sort of balance between like practicing on stuff that will hopefully then help you to be even more relaxed and more comfortable when those, when those real important moments happen. But still, everything goes out the window. You're going to make, you're going to make the music sound good 
You're not going to be thinking, well, I've been working on holding my stick like that, so I better hold my stick like this. Right. No, you're going to make it sound good. <laughs> you you kind of hold way back, right? I mean, I am way back. I'm kind of I, – I went through a period where I held way back. I've gone up a little bit more now. Nice. Um, but, yeah, it depends. I mean, and I find that, like, holding my sticks different ways or different parts also – help me with different sort of tempos or different feels or different sounds, you know. Um, sometimes I'll use the butt end of the stick, yeah. you know, on the snare for that deep sound, or even on the on the cymbal, just because it feels better in my hand to play a certain rhythm or it sounds different, you know. So, you know, I mean, I'm kind of all over the map with my technique, honestly. I'm not that proud. I mean, I think I appreciate what you said about it, but like I see a lot of flaws in my hands, you know? Oh, my left uh, hand is like, <laughs> you know, I mean, your left hand, I'm just been swapping. If I can't imagine how many backbeats, you think about it, how many <laughs> backbeats have we played? So I've been oh. playing since 76. That's yeah. a lot of backbeats, man. That's a lot of backbeats. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> have, you ever, have you ever had any problem with any tendonitis or anything? No, I mean, sometimes things will get um, tingly or I'll wake up in my bunk and my hands, left hands asleep or it gets kind of tingly. And yeah. you just, you, you know, you stretch, you put it in right. hot water, you, you know, and I, I hopefully, you know, uh, drinking, drinking lots of water, taking good vitamins, stretching, yeah. getting some aerobic exercise. But I mean, it's amazing that I, that we don't have more problems because we're taking this piece of wood, we're manipulating it and we're hitting the edge of this, me r I mean, rim shots, yeah. that's can can't be good for you. Yeah, I know. Well, I did have a little bit of a problem um, with my left hand. Like right. I had a thing where, where this was bothering me years ago and it got pretty bad. And I went, you know, I, I did immediately did physical therapy and I got these sort of light braces that I wore. I, I played the whole time. It wasn't like I could stop playing, you know? Right. And, uh, and I actually, my physical therapist was like, you know, you should continue to play. Just be careful. But it kind of made me look at things a little differently. And I tried to, you know, became more conscious about staying more relaxed because, you know, if you tense up, that's going to cause problems too. Yeah. Um, and ultimately, you sound better when you're relaxed. But, you know, it's... It's, I mean, almost every musician that I ask, guitar players, bass players, drummers, at some point they have a problem, you know, and yeah. the main thing is not to let it freak you out, you know. And just, oh, it's terrifying. You, I, I remember shedding a tear one time in the shower because I was, I was like, oh my God, my career is over. I have a shooting yeah. pain right here in my left hand. And then you go and I went to the, um, where they do massage therapy and stuff and they did like a little laser gun to kind of break up some of the cartilage and stuff. Right, um, right. But the surgery, I think, is the thing you want to avoid, right? If you can. I, I know a few people that have had to do it, yeah. and they came out good. You yeah. know, but I think that's the last resort, you know? Yeah. And luckily, I've, I've had no problems for years, you know, knock on wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but I, I, I try to remain more conscious about it. Because you're right. I mean, what we do, it's not, it's not really normal. Our, our, our bodies weren't meant for that, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, t two and four, like you said, Jesus. I mean. I, uh, over and over and over. Um. So, yeah, I was going to ask you about – what was I going to ask you about? We were talking about um, potentially um, – oh, I know. I was going to sing high praise of you because there's a video. If you go to drummerworld.com, there's this amazing video of this clinic you did for the Percussive Arts Society in 2018. And, you, I mean, it's so – such a great thing you start the groove there's a, and you start with two and one and three on the kick two and four on the hi-hat two and four on the snare drum just boom whack right and then start to and then you start opening the hi-hat and then more stuff and more subdivisions not a lot of fills not a lot of cymbal crashes and just building the intensity but maintaining that pocket the whole time and you could see the look on people's faces and i'm i'm thinking to myself this one guy up here doesn't know what's going on because he's waiting for the the, the blast of like Billy Cobham 32nd yeah. notes on the three floor toms. And I'm like, this is gorgeous. So they don't show the whole video. It's just the front part. I wish I could have witnessed it and heard what you had to say after that. Well, I remember that. That was, um, you know, first off, it was an honor to be asked to do pass it because I used to go when I was in high school, I used to go every year for four years, five years, you know. But you sound and, amazed. I mean, dude, well, they, well, they I, were, you treated people that day. Well, my attitude was like most of these, most of these uh, drum festivals, it's a chop fest, you know. Right. And that's cool. And I wanted to sort of just my, I wanted to talk more about pocket and groove playing, you know. And so I just, I, I, I 
one of the first things I said, it was like, you know, I want to talk about, you know, I'm going to play my favorite beat. This is the beat that, you know, the, you know, this is where it all starts kind of in this, in this kind of plane. And I do the same thing whenever I teach a private lesson. I don't, I don't teach a lot of private lessons, but mm-hmm. people might roll through New York and call, hey, I'm in town, can I do a lesson? I'm, I'm like, I'll do like a one-off or something. And the first thing I do is I'm like, play a, play a straight beat, you know, one and three on the bass drum, two and four on the snare, eighth notes on the hi-hat. And they never do it. They always, you know, start, and I'm like, oh, no, stop, stop, stop. And it takes four or five times, and, and then all of a sudden it's like people start to sound really good. Yeah. I'm like, you sound really good now. You're, you know, you're, you're, do, you're focused all of a sudden. You know, your time is good. You're not playing all this extra stuff. Um, so, you know, I mean, pocket and time, it, it's an art, and it's just as deep. That simple beat is just as deep as any. And I'm into all that stuff, too, of course. Sure. But, like, but, I mean, I, I think I just wanted to sort of show that at that clinic that, you know, this is – and you're right. Some people are just like, well, this is boring. <laughs> you know, but I mean, whatever. there's a couple of guys that just have this look on their face, and I'm like, they have no, they're not going to be the ones working because yeah. they, they're not getting the beauty of it. Yeah, and then, but like you said, there's enough people came up to me afterwards and, and appreciated that. And so it's like, you know, you always, I think you know, as a, as a, as a performer, you know, when you're out there playing these, these big concerts, it's like, you know, as a drummer, obviously we're there to make them serve the song and the band, but as a drummer, you know, if one if one kid comes out of that place that you hit and is like maybe wants to play the drums because they saw you play or is inspired by what you did, I mean that's just there's no better feeling I think for us. I know for me when I meet people, we always go out and talk to people after the show, and whenever a kid comes up to me or not, they're not kids anymore. You know, a lot of times they're, <laughs> but they they're like you know I I I was really into I bought that record back then and you know you inspired me to pick up a pair of sticks. I mean that's like the best feeling in the world. Oh my god! What yeah. what's, what's better than that? You know what I mean? I like it when they come up to you and they say, I've been listening to since I was in the sixth grade. And I'm like, what? <laughs> uh, and yeah. they're like, yeah, dude, the first record came out in 2004. I'm like, oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, I know. Holy cow. Now, looking back at your, your, your body of work, do you have a couple of standout tracks that are just like, you know, good job, Aaron? Well, I will say that, uh, and it's the obvious choice, but I'm and I'm so glad that it sounds good as two princes. Sure. You know, which I'll never be able to top as far as success. I mean, it's you know, um, but I hear it all the time on the radio, and I'm just like, shoo! I'm glad I got that one good. You know, because you know, it's uh, there's other tracks where you know you might be like, okay, that's good, but I could have done that one better. Yeah. But I, I do really like that one. It's just you know, it uh, from from the sound we got. To the way everybody in the band sounds, uh, you know, the pocket, everything just, it just, and as you know, recording a lot of records yourself, it doesn't always work. I mean, there's a lot of, thi- a lot of things involved in making A lot of a factors. Good, a lot of factors. And it's, you know, obviously it starts with a good song, but it goes way beyond that. You know, I mean, getting the right drum track, getting the right sound, everybody, the right tempo, the right parts. There's so many factors that make a song just sound good, not to mention a, end up being a big hit, you know? Oh, yeah. It, it, it got, so much goes into that. So, well, that, I mean, that's perfect. That's a snapshot. That's like, that's where like a soccer mom can hear that first measure and by beat four, she knows what song it is. So it's like <laughs> sonic stamp. Like, so, and so do you have other standout tracks from Spindle? And then if there, are there some other hidden gems with other artists? There's definitely some other hidden gems. Like, like uh, I did a, I did a few records with a great artist named Rachel Yamagata. Oh yeah. Yeah, she's amazing. One of my favorite artists that I've worked with over the years. And there's a couple tracks on her her first uh, studio release, which is called Happenstance. There's a song called Let Letter Red, and there's another one called uh, Paper Doll. Those two, two of the favorite things I've, I've ever played on. I'll have to Check look that up because yeah. that's that's like in my lane because I really have a soft spot for the kind of like somewhat tortured um you know female troubadour you know yeah. that's that has all the pain and the loss and maybe some happiness in her music you know it's like yeah. almost like uh, we have radio station in, in nashville lightning 100 it's like a triple a format and i remember her getting a lot of attention from that record yeah yeah she's great and i uh i've done a, i've been involved in I guess three or four of her records, but those two tracks, Letter Red and uh, Paper Doll, and just and Letter Red, we cut down in Compass Point Studios down in uh, the Bahamas. Nice. It's great. 
And then that track, Letter Red, will be cut at the C room at the power station, which is the, uh, the smaller room. It's the same as the A, but it's just a little smaller. Also incredible sounding, uh, sounding room. So those stand out. There's, there's a, you know, I've, I've done a lot of records with John Osborne. There's definitely some standouts. Uh, I'm trying to think. There's a new record we just did that just came out that's that's got some really great stuff on it. Um, What's that called? God, what? I can't believe I'm forgetting. It's the, the latest title. Joan Osborne. The record, latest, folks. Uh, yeah. It'll yeah, be first out. on Spotify. Check it out. Exactly. It's it's cool. It's great. We did a we did a a soul blues record about eight or nine years ago that uh, got a Grammy nomination, and it was. Um, I really like that one too. There's some really, there's some really great stuff on it. Um, really cool drum sounds. We did it at this big church with um, oh, what's the guy's name? The engineer who did all those Lenny Kravitz records. Um, oh yeah. Um, I'm 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 just forgetting his name right now. It'll come to me. But it's a funny story. to sort of like which way things can go in the studio. Yeah. So I so I get there. They're like you know show up around uh, you know whenever ten or eleven. Bring your drums and. So I showed up and I, I brought my kit and it was a soul record. So I was going for sort of a, you know, trying to sort of get that Motown sound, you know, I had my drums tuned pretty low. I had old A Zildjian cymbals. Yeah. So, so, so he, the engineer, and I wish I could remember his name, Lenny Kravitz's engineer. Everybody look it up. He's a, he's real. Cause you know, all those Lenny Kravitz, it's real vintage. He's really vintage guy. Vintage and, drums. Yeah. Yeah. He has all these incredible, like he uses all these old, mics that, that people use in, in uh, on movie sets. I never said anything like them. Like these big long movie set mics, incredible stuff. Wow. So he so he goes back, he sits behind the kit, and he's he takes the takes my stick, hits the snare drum, and it's real dead. He's like, okay, do me a favor, can you go over there and grab that point pointed at some drum, some Ludwig or something, I don't know. Can you bring me that drum? So I said, okay. I handed it to him. He handed me mine. He puts it Hits it. He's like, yes, that sounds cool. Then he's like, go grab that floor tom. So we go through this thing. Eventually, <laughs> eventually, eventually, my whole kit's gone, and the stuff that he had was there. Now it's a good lesson because a lot of guys would have just been like, get the fuck out of here. I'm using my drums. I know. But I think it's like I'm here trying to. I like this guy has a thing. I'm gonna I'm gonna go with this, you know. Yeah. Um, and so. The only thing I put my foot down was he, he asked me to, he said, grab that symbol. I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to use these symbols. Because <laughs> so, they were old, they were old vintage, you know, A's. They were perfect. He was like, okay, cool. So anyway, so now I have his kit set up. It sounds great. And we, you know, we're maybe a day or two into the track and everything's going great. And we start doing this one track. Um, oh, God. Uh, what is it called? Anyway, I'm, I'm just spacing on titles now. You know, we need... I think that you and I are the men of a certain age. We need Prevagen. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> nah, or some Ginkgo nah. Balboa. Hey, it's, we'll take hey, some it, It's hard to remember every last song you played on. But I remember that. I, I remember that. But anyway, so this was this. It was an Ike and Tina Turner song. I can tell you that. And uh, it was one of the funkier songs. And in pre-production, it was one of the more sort of I'm, I'm digging in pretty heavy. It's funky. I'm kind of laying into it more than I am on some of the other stuff. And so we do a take. And he says to me, he's like, do me a favor, play real soft, hit the snare drum right in the middle and just hit real light. I'm going to crank up the mics. He's like, so he has me do it. So I do it. And it said, and it, to my ears at the time, it just sounded super wimpy, you know, cause I'm, I'm in there right, right on top of it. I'm not hearing what he's hearing through my phones, you know, so it sounds wimpy, but I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go down this road. So we do the take. I play it the whole time. I'm thinking this sucks. This I mean, like, is it like you're talking like pianissimo or like kind of mezzo? No, like mezzo forte, like yeah, the, yeah. but light. Yeah. And and again, before I was really digging into it because it's like right. this funk song. Um, I'm playing real light, and I'm the whole time. I'm thinking I'm doing it. I'm trying my best to make it work, but I'm not in my head. I'm like, this is got you know, this isn't happening. So we finish the take. Joan screams like, yes. You know, and I'm like, oh, shit, they're going to use this, you know. And, uh, and so I go in the control room, and it sounds unbelievable. And I was like, this is just a great example of how, like, you know, the, the engineer-musician relationship, having that trust, even though it may not be your instinct, it's worth it to go down that road. And it's one of, the, one of my favorite songs 
I've ever played on. I got to I got to look at my phone and get the name of it because Oh, that's amazing. Yeah, I I can I can see that, you know? I mean, it's like whatever that engineer wants. It's like I work with a guy that did that all the blondie and the knack stuff. Um, and he wants my cymbals really high and out of the way of the Tom mics. And I don't play them like in Dugu Chancellor that high normally, right? But for him, it's like, whatever you need, young man, you know, to make the, yeah. <laughs> uh, to help his, you know. Yeah, so that's, that's, that song is called Game of Love. Game of Love, and it's on a record called Bring It On Home by Joan Osborne. Beautiful. And her latest record that just came out is called Trouble and Strife. And so obviously you're pulling the beater off the head in those situations. Yes, yeah. and I te I tend to pull my beater off the off the bass drum head. That's nice. I, te I tend to go off of it. Um, I like to use a, a a lot of times I use a soft you know those soft plesi mallets. Yeah, I like those. Um, I've, that's sort of my go to. Um, but you know, depending on the situation, but but I do over the years I've developed where I do try to come off. Not not all the time. Back in the old days, I definitely did not. You know, yeah. I've I've sort of tried to do more over the years. My heels have gone down, you know. Uh, so, you yeah, know. yeah. For me, I like to. I it's almost like I have two personalities. Like so, any anything that's like seriously like modern backbeat oriented, I end up burying the beater like Picaro or Aronoff. Sure. And then if it's more vibey and it has a tinge of anything vintage or jazzy it's yeah. like heel down absolutely and it depends on the bass drum obviously if you if you got a lot of muffling in your bass drum it's cool to go in there but if it's wide open and you go in there it's just gonna sound horrible so a yeah. lot a lot of it a lot of it is the nature of the drum too for me as well you know yeah when we go in and we do those um those bond those bonzo tribute tributes right. that brian tishy does he's got yeah. a 26 inch bass drum with absolutely no muffling inside yeah. and, you're, do -do -cutters, <laughs> do -do -cutters. and you've, you're just like if you've never worked on pulling it out of the out of the head um you're gonna do yeah. it that day exactly you know exactly. a lot of these yeah, that, these guys are like oh my god i can't bury this because it exactly. goes Pfft. yeah they, they, you can't you can't mess around on a big drum like that it'll it won't work <laughs> it's oh, funny. totally man so um where, is your spot is it in your house do you get to go downstairs or do you have to No, i used to have it in my house uh when i was in manhattan but I'm out in Brooklyn now. So this, this spot is in Brooklyn. Nice. I live in Williamsburg, right by the Williamsburg Bridge. And my spot here is just about a mile away, like an East Williamsburg, Bushwick area. So I get in my car. I'm here in five minutes, you know. That's killer. And, uh, yeah. Do you know our pal Sammy Marandino? Yeah. So Sammy, Sammy played we on that first Joan Osborne record. And, right. and, and he's like, he, he said that they really wanted me to sound almost like self-taught, like a garage drummer on that. So he's got that funny story about that thing. But small world, yeah. good pal yeah. of mine. I love Sammy. I mean, I've been up to his place for uh, – he, he made me a great steak dinner one night. You know, what he's a got spot. A great, oh, yeah, got that great studio. It's a beautiful place. He really great, does, uh, great drummer. Have you ever yeah. thought about doing um, Broadway since it's right there or nah? You know, it's – I did – the only Broadway I did was I subbed for Bernard Purdy on Hair a few times. And, you know, Purdy called me, and I wasn't going to say no to Purdy. Come on. And, uh, and I was really into it. I love that music, and it was a really good experience. And I think it's great, but I, I think for me, kind of like what I was talking about earlier, I, don't, I think it would, it would burn me out a little bit, like just sort of doing that same thing night after night after night. Um, but – it's it's a great gig, and you know I'm mean, and you know so many of New York's best drummers have that as their bread and butter gig, and it's great. I mean, luckily I don't need it. You know, I got I got the Spin Doctors as my bread and butter gig. You know, I, I can't it. tell you if I didn't. You know, if I didn't listen. I mean, everybody's everybody's situation is different. You know, and I in a different in a different world or life, I'm, I'm sure I would be happy to do it. But um, I'm a little care. I've been asked to do some stuff there. And I've, you know, it's one of those things where I've declined a few times just because it's also a lot of work. Like if you're just going to sub, you know, for, for, some, for somebody, I mean, it, it's a lot of work to learn that. It's a whole different, it's a whole different thing than playing, you know, sessions or gigs or whatever. So, um, but I had a really, really positive experience, you know, doing it, uh, doing hair. It was, it was very cool. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I had like a Broadway drummers roundtable on the episode it hasn't aired yet, but it was Sammy Warren Odes and Sean McDaniel. So like kind of like three generations and three different styles of Broadway drummers. And it's so interesting to hear about all the guys that are ready to go in the wings. Like I went to school with this cat. You probably know him, Brian Delaney. 
Yeah. Um, oh yeah. The New York Dolls and yeah, Session. Know, Cat, yeah. So so he's like he's like man, I know all these different books and I'm ready to go. And they call him like that's a lot yeah. of ma- maintenance just Absolutely. in case. It is. It is. But it's a, but it's also a great thing. And like I said, I mean, New York City's best is on Broadway now. You know, it used to be, it used to be like you had Broadway guys. And you had studio guys, and it was very, it's all mixed together now, which I think is great. You know, yeah. it's, um, and a lot of my friends are, 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 have Broadway gigs and, you know, and really enjoy it. So it's cool. Yeah. Now, now I don't want to keep you too long, but your spot there, if somebody wants to get into tracking and putting a, a, a spot together, what do they need to get in the game? Obviously, you got world class mics and world class drums, and if those drums could talk, it'd be amazing. But, you really, it's just like a, 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 a versatile sounding kit and a nice Mac and right. I mean, I, that's how I started. You know, when I right. first got, when I first had my first studio in my apartment in New York City, it was back in the late nineties when the, the ADATs came out, and I had a Mackie board and three ADATs and some mics, like everybody who got into it. And I sort of built on that. And then what I did was I partnered up with my buddy Roman Clune. And Roman is a real engineer. I mean, I learned, I can engineer, I did it, I was doing it, I was, it was almost getting overwhelming because I was finding myself in all these situations where I'm engineering, producing, playing drums, and, you know, sometimes it's better not to take on all those roles. And I met Roman, and he was interested in partnering up, and, you know, Roman came with great gear, you know, so Roman has, I mean, I own a lot of my own mics and speakers and stuff, but, you know, between the two of us, we have, and mostly him, you know, we have state-of-the-art gear, and he's as good of an engineer as I've ever met. So it's a, it's a really nice uh, situation for me because now I'm not having to do everything anymore, and it just makes for a better, a better studio. You oh, know, yeah. But I think, I, I think for drummers, you know, in, in this day and age, it's definitely an advantage if you have some sort of home recording setup. Yeah. It doesn't have to be the greatest thing in the world. You know, I'm lucky to have this great setup with Roman, but, like, you know, you can make, as you know, you can make – gorgeous sounding recordings with not a whole lot of stuff. And the main thing, like anything, is getting a good sound yourself out of your drums, you know. Uh, you know, I'm a real believer that obviously having great gears, great drums and cymbals is, is very helpful. But I think, you know, you have to learn how to make what you have sound really well. I mean, I, you know, in New York City in particular, because so many of the big fancy studios have closed, you know, it used to be like you call for a session, okay, cartage, they'll get your stuff, you bring all your stuff over there. There's just not as much of that in New York as there used to be. Um, yeah. So a lot of times you end up in studios like mine, smaller studios that have drums there. And sometimes the drums aren't so great. Sometimes they are. But you have to just learn how to, I think it's really important to learn how to quickly adapt and make what you have sound good. Know how to tune your drums know how to use tape, know how to, you know, quickly sort of hear how that engineer is working. That's going to affect how you're going to be playing. Do they have a lot of compression on or not? You know, these are the the tools that will make you sound, I don't have to tell you, but people that are listening, these are the tools that will make you sound good in the studio. Sure. Um, and, And also, you know, developing relationships with engineers or if it's a new engineer, opening up that dialogue, like I t- like that story I told you about Henry Hirsch. That's his name, Henry Hirsch. Henry Hirsch, you heard it here first. Opening up that dialogue, if somebody tells you, like, look, I'm going to compress the hell out of the overhead, so go light on the cymbals. If, if, if you know the overheads are cranked, stay off those cymbals, you know. Um, you know, so... Or you could make a suggestion. Listen, on this track, I'm going to play really light if you want to, like, up the microphones. or You know, keeping that dialogue is is going to make or break you in the studio. So, again, it's great if you can afford or you have an opportunity where you have a really great setup or you're working in f- fancy studios, but you can make a lot out of a little, you know? Yeah, no question man. about it. Well, what's the next five years for you? What are you looking forward to, man? I mean, obviously, the world opening up would be wonderful. I can't wait to hug all of my friends. I mean, I can't. I hope that 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 lasts as a tradition. I don't know what we're going to be doing. Are we doing this this elbow uh, thing for the rest of our lives? I miss it. I I, th- I know. Me too. I think we're going to get out of this. It feels like we're on our way out. Uh, it might we might be doing this for a while. I think it's going to take people a long time to get 
rid of the anxiety of this whole thing. You know, like, I mean, I'm, I'm fully vaccinated and I'm still hesitant to like walk around without a mask and, you know. Oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, and, you know, restaurants, like, they're like, it's an open air restaurant, Rich. And I'm like, yeah. yeah, but I haven't gone to a restaurant in a year. I know. I'm still, I'm still a little nuts. Exactly. So let's hope that, uh, I, I think we're going to start seeing some stuff, some good stuff. I actually have a couple gigs in May. Um, and, you know, spins have a few things on the books. We'll see if they happen. Yeah. You know, but, you know, the next five years, I mean, I'm looking forward to just continuing to try to grow and improve as a musician. Um, looking forward to continuing to work with, you know, spin doctors. And, and I'm lucky to have some some good ongoing relationships with people like Joan Osborne and James Maddock. And, you know, I enjoy... I enjoy working with new people and recording with new people, but it's also nice when you work with a lot of the same people because those those relationships and that trust is, is such a nice thing to have. You oh, know? God, yeah. So I'm looking forward to continuing, hopefully maintaining the things I have and adding to them. Yeah. And, uh, you know, continuing with my own music and uh, just trying to stay healthy and happy, you know. And a food blog, maybe. I thought about it, man. You know, drum drum food blog. You know, I mean, I, mean, I, I wish I, I wish I would have kept better notes over the years. Like about like a, I always thought like a touring, a restaurant guide for the touring musician, uh, from from like you know low low end to high end. You know, like you want to get a, a seven dollar lunch, great, and you want to go to like the high end steakhouse. I mean, because I I'm into all that. You know, so it's like so when you're on the road, what was your thing? Like I would always like I, like a crazy person. I would like always book like a little drum lessons or a clinic during the day, you know, before my sound check, like a crazy person. But I, I almost feel like go if when we get back to touring, I want to do different things. Like I'll hit a gym or it would be nice to like go do some more museums or pawn yeah. shops. Like what was your thing when you were, when you, well, you know, at the beginning it was always like, check out the city, you know? Yeah. Go, go, and then like for, you know, the first couple of times you go to Europe, it's like, okay, I'm going to go check out the museum today. I'm going to walk around the city. And after years of that, you know, it becomes more about like, I'm going to take a nap. I've been flying all day. <laughs> you know, so like the first thing I do when I get to a new town off, you know, because I do a lot of fly dates. Most of what I do are fly dates. And uh, so, you know, you're tired, you've been traveling. A lot of times I will go for, I will try to find a really cool lunch, like the local cuisine. Like if I'm down south, I'm looking for the best barbecue in town. Ah. Or, or if I'm like, you know, west, southern west, I'm looking for the best Mexican. I try to look for, you know, I try to look for the cuisine of the area, have a nice lunch, you know, maybe get a little nap in. If there's a gym, try to get a little workout in. Um, so... That's 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 my thing, you know. Well, sometimes I'll go to the local drum shop if there's a cool one in town. But I'm definitely like, no matter what band I'm out on the road with, I'm always the food guy. Like everybody asks me, okay, so where we where should we eat, Aaron? <laughs> you know, it's like I've it's just funny. I've taken on this responsibility. That is sometimes, a lot of responsibility because like, yeah, thanks a lot. I got food poisoning. The gig is yeah, canceled tonight. Well, exactly. But uh, yeah, so I'm like I'm always the go to. I mean, people even call me if I'm not on the gig. They're, hey, I'm in, you know, Kentucky. Where, where should I get barbecue? You know, yeah. Like, have you ever heard of Yelp, man? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, but it's not. It's not. It hasn't been. No, I know. It hasn't been kissed by Aaron. Um. Yeah. So, what is um, what is the best pizza in New York? Because I asked all the Broadway guys, and they all had different answers. Well, for the New York City slice, I think Joe's Pizza is the best. Now, what, is there multiple locations? There are. The original one is on Carmine Street. There's one on 14th Street. There's one in Williamsburg on Bedford now. Um, I think there might be one in Park Slope. But it's to me, it's just the best New York City, no bullshit slice. And there's a lot of bad slices in New York City. There's a lot of them. But usually at two in the morning, if you come crawling out of a, you know, a little intoxicated, you're like, I don't well, care. Let's fold well, it in half and eat it. Like you said, a bad pizza and a bad donut are still pretty good. Now, what, but, is, is there such thing as a bad bagel in New York City, or where's the best? I don't, you know, that's a tough one. I mean, there's actually a great bagel shop right down the street from my studio. Yeah. It's like as, as good as any. You know, there's a lot of good bagels. I think you get a bad bagel if you just get a bagel at like a bodega. Yeah. You know, they're like, I don't know where they get them. They're kind of like, so, but most, most like bagel shops, if they're making their own bagels, it's going to be pretty good. Ah, yeah, and I like although, how they can... I, I heard about this, like, 
the best bagel is in LA now. Did you see that? Oh, wait, Larry King was partners in this restaurant where they're actually chemically treating the water to mimic New York City water, and it's right wow. up the street. I got to get there. Yeah, you got to try that. That's funny. That's <laughs> but funny. I also like how they, you know, they have this option now for the people that are watching their waistline where they'll scoop out the, some of the bread in the right. middle. And then I get the, um, like, uh, it's got like a little bit of everything, like the chives and garlic and all that kind of stuff, but it's tofu. Oh, wow. Because I'm, I'm lactose intolerant. So it's like I can either take two lactates. I totally keep that laboratory in business. Yeah. <laughs> Lactate, are you listening? We're looking for sponsors. Or I'll do the tofu um, wow. bread. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome, man. Well, man, I love all these insights and I just think it's, you know, you've already left your mark on humanity. You know, people are going to be, the aliens are coming and they're going to look at a, a, the, the timeline from this particular time in human history and the soundtrack's going to be, you know, two princes. Well, I appreciate that. You know, it's, uh, it's interesting doing something like that so early on in my career too, you know, yeah. it's like usually it's sort of a build and, it, you know, in a way, it's a blessing and a curse, you know. I mean, I'm, I couldn't be more grateful for it. But it, there's also sort of that thing like, shit, am I ever going to get my snare drum to sound that good again? And am I ever going to have something that successful again, you know? But, but you know, it's, it's also enabled me to, um, to have this, this cool career and maybe be a little bit more choosy about what I do. And, and I'm grateful, like I said, just, you know, to, uh, to have things going. And I look forward to just, you know, it's just that inspiration to keep moving forward and keep, keep growing with it, you know? That's a great, great attitude, great spirit, man. And if people want to find you, do you like to be found on the World Wide Web? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter. You, I have a website, AaronComas.com. There's a, you can contact me, you can email me through that. You know, um, anybody who's interested in me doing drum tracks for them can just reach out. I'm set up here all the time to do that. So, Yeah, if I was right. a singer-songwriter, I'd hire you. <laughs> and I love hearing from drummers. I mean, I get, I, anytime anybody writes me on any of these formats, I'll always write you back. If you have a question about anything, I love answering and, and uh, communicating with drummers, you know, about stuff like that. It's, it's always, Absolutely, always man. a thrill. Well, I can't, I can't wait to maybe connect in person and do the bagel or do the slice, get a cup yeah, of man. coffee, maybe splurge and get one of those donuts. A lot of food. Well, I'm hungry. I haven't had breakfast yet, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, make sure you got something to eat. Yeah, listen, next time we're in the same city, we're going to hang out for sure. This, this is going to definitely happen. Everybody, hey, this is, uh, this is a groundbreaking thing, man. I really appreciate your time, Aaron. Thank you for asking me to do this. It's a real pleasure, Rich. Absolutely, man. And hey, to all the listeners out there, the Rich Redman Show at gmail.com. That's how you can contact me. And usually, my co host, Jim McCarthy, Jim McCarthy Voiceovers.com. And as always, be sure to subscribe, share, rate, and review. We're not stopping. We're looking at two years doing this, over 115 episodes, and we really appreciate the support. So keep coming back for the good stuff. We're going to be here, and we'll see you next time. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks a lot, man. Take care, buddy. This has been The Rich Redmond Show. Subscribe, rate, and follow along at richredmond.com forward slash podcasts.